my eyes. Why have you come back? Please, sir. We've done what you told us. We brought you the broomstick of the Wicked Witch of the West. We melted her. Oh, you liquidated her, eh? Very resourceful. Yes, sir. So we'd like you to keep your promise to us, if you please, sir. Not so fast. Not so fast. I'll have to give the matter a little thought. Go away and come back tomorrow. Tomorrow? You've had plenty of time already. Yeah. Do not arouse the wrath of the great and powerful Oz. I said come back tomorrow. If you are really great and powerful, you keep your promises. Do you presume to criticize the great Oz? You ungrateful creatures think yourselves lucky that I'm giving you audience tomorrow instead of 20 years from now. Oh. The great Oz has spoken. Oh. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The great Oz has spoken. Who are you? Oh, I, I, I am the great and powerful wizard of Oz. You are? Uh, I don't believe you. No, I'm afraid it's true. There's no other wizard except me. You humbug! Yeah. Yes, it's exactly so. I'm uh, humble. In any number of ways, American politics resembles this scene from The Wizard of Oz. Like the great Oz, Democratic and Republican politicians make promises while knowing they can't possibly keep them. Like the great Oz, Democratic and Republican politicians like to imagine themselves as great and powerful, even in the face of Dorothy's rebuke. If you were really great and powerful, you'd keep your promises. Like the great Oz, Democratic and Republican politicians are full of sound and furry. That really is, in Shakespeare's words, a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and furry, signifying nothing. Like the great Oz, Democratic and Republican politicians don't want typical Americans to pay any attention to the man or the financiers controlling appearances from behind the curtain. Like the great Oz, Democratic and Republican politicians are exposed as nothing other than, in the words of veteran Washington journalist Jack Germond, very ordinary people, other than perhaps the tenacious ambition required to win the office. So these audacious political salesmen try to present themselves as magic performing wizards. But if we look behind the theatrical curtain, we would find exactly what Dorothy and her friends found. Humbug. If the very rich try to maintain their power and control over American society by resort to naked force, Americans would not acquiesce in passive resignation and tolerate it. So the very rich have to disguise their power and control by hiding behind numerous front organizations, the Democratic and Republican parties being the most prominent. The existence of two parties preserves the illusion of choice, so that whenever populist agitation begins to ferment, as it inevitably will when 80% of the population owns no more than 8% of the nation's investment assets, the American people as one shrewd historian has observed, can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extensive shifts in policy that might threaten the rule and government-bestowed privileges of the very rich. As further explained by the foremost libertarian scholar during the 20th century, maintaining two parties means that the public, growing weary of the evils of democratic rule, can turn to out-of-power Republicans and then when they, weary of the Republican alternative, they can turn once again to the eager Democrats waiting in the wings. And so, the ruling elites maintain a shell game, while the American public constitute the suckers, or the marks, for the ruling con artists. The financial dependence by both parties on the very rich renders representation of typical Americans impossible. Every candidate who accepts contributions from large donors or bundlers, or 
who takes $1,000 speaking honorariums or goes on expense-paid trips sponsored by lobbyists. Every candidate who, in essence, accepts campaign financing primarily from the very rich rather than small amounts given by individual citizens, but who nevertheless has the audacity to seek votes from typical Americans, has an irreconcilable conflict of interest that is indisputable and of such magnitude as to get one dismissed for unethical conduct in any other line of work. In the effort to mask their unethical duplicity and disguise the reality of a political system controlled by the very rich, the Republicans and Democrats employ a battery of public relations professionals who cleverly use a wide array of propaganda tricks to divert the attention of typical Americans. While politics, in a sense, has always been a con game, according to political author Joe McGinnis, it wasn't until 1968 that a national campaign pioneered the political use of marketing strategies relied on by business. Nixon's campaign chief of staff, Bob Haldeman, was a former advertising professional, and he brought with him the insight of that profession, which is that visuals prevail over words and policy. But it was the team surrounding Ronald Reagan in 1980 who perfected the sophistication of the art. Veteran Washington journalist Hedrick Smith wrote that the Reagan team successfully combined the marketing strategies of Madison Avenue with the glitter of Hollywood to create numerous images that repeatedly masked the reality of the Reagan administration's divisive policies. As president, Reagan operated powerfully at the level of visions, dreams, and legends, the most dramatic ingredients of political imagery in a blend of fact and fiction, wish and reality. Every campaign since has adopted the Reagan formula so that politics has become little more than what George Orwell described as a mass of lies, evasions, and folly, where Democrats and Republicans wrap themselves in a cloak of fiction deliberately designed to exploit the deepest emotional yearnings of typical Americans. To disillusion ourselves, we must sweep away the aggressively promoted political illusions that would keep we typical Americans from uniting to reclaim our heritage of liberty. Historian Daniel Borston has written, What we need first and now is to disillusion ourselves. We suffer primarily not from our vices or our weaknesses, but from our illusions. We are haunted not by reality, but by those images we have put in place of reality. Seeing behind the curtain of political propaganda necessitates exposing the methods of the illusionist. Despite the much ballyhooed pretension by both parties that they represent us, the parties in fact actually act to absorb populist protest and render our interests ineffective. All the campaign hoopla, all the political ads, all the liberal conservative divisiveness, all the political rhetoric is mere theater, nothing more than an elaborate propaganda effort to disguise the hostile capture of our political system by making it appear that typical Americans are exercising control and making democratic decisions. To that end, both political parties continually engage in extensive market research, phone surveys, public opinion polling, focus groups, and psychological testing that probe the morass of our opinions, emotions, and feelings. Public relations professionals and Hollywood choreographers then produce visuals that are psychologically targeted to subliminally appeal to those opinions, emotions, and feelings. To the extent a politician never reveals true thoughts and feelings, speaks in trite platitudes, avoids direct answers, and is shrewdly ambiguous about policy, he or she can become an empty vessel whose persona and words are given meaning by the impressions created by the visuals. In this way, 
millions are fooled into associating their deepest political ideals with a politician. And since the perception is created out of our thoughts, the politician cannot appear to be anything less than what many of us expect. This art of sophisticated deception, known in former times as myth-making, but known today in the more benign language as projecting an image, is a gross fabrication. Although the image is appealing to many of us, it rarely is representative of what the politician is really like, is completely unrelated to what the politician actually does, and allows the politician to be someone who shares your values without the politician changing his covert political agenda largely determined by the very rich. Former United States Senate staffer and current political analyst Lawrence O'Donnell writes that, I was asked to review a political speech. My approach to reviewing political speeches is to examine what deceptions are employed, because every speech by every candidate for president has its deceptions. In the words of Nixon campaign assistant Jim Sage, it's a farce, a delicious farce, self-deception carried to the ninth degree. If a politician has a record of voting against the environment, the image strategy is to begin visiting zoos and engaging in tree plantings back home to bolster an environmental image. If a politician lacks foreign policy credentials, the image strategy is to schedule a few widely publicized international trips. If a politician wants to appear to be compassionate, the image strategy is to arrange a few photo opportunities at disaster sites or slums. If a politician needs to appear to be spiritual, the image strategy is to end speeches with a religious reference or appeal. 